All right, I have 6 o'clock. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for our regular session of August 1, 2017. Uh, at this time, the first order of business is the opening prayer and the pledges of allegiance to the flags of the United States and the state of Texas, and Councilmember Thompson will lead us in both, if you'll please join me in standing. Father, what a great evening. We're celebrating life in so many different ways tonight, from scouts who are with us as they look forward to the advancements they can make in the positive contributions to their community, not just for the next few years, but for decades to come. As we celebrate the advancement of a well-deserved promotion and how that impacts the city of Schertz for probably decades to come. As we celebrate our seniors with a vote on the agenda, thank you for reminding us that we as citizens of Schertz have been blessed so much by you and we have so much to celebrate, so much to be thankful for. So help us celebrate with you tonight the many blessings that are seen just in this one meeting. We ask in your son's name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Before we move on to the city events and announcements, I do want to recognize uh, a number of the Boy Scouts we have here this evening from Troop 477. Ty Underwood, Ben Harris, Brigham Stanley, Ronald Patterson, Kata, is that correct? What? Coda. That's why I asked. Coda Garner, Garrett Eldridge, and Isaac Harris. Welcome. Glad to have all of you with us this evening. Very good. All right, next on the agenda this evening, we have um, city events and announcements and start up with announcements of upcoming city events. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this Saturday, uh, August 5th, Primrose School of Shirts is having their grand opening and ribbon cutting at 10 a.m. That's at 4993 Shirts Parkway. Uh, Thursday, August 10th, Wednesday, August 16th, and Thursday, August 17th, we're having our community budget meetings. The first on August 10th is Church United Methodist Church off 3009. The second on the 16th is at Corbett Middle School. And the third one is at the North Community Center on the 17th. Also, as a reminder, uh, filing has begun for the city council election. Uh, you can contact the city secretary's office for information on that. Uh, a reminder that Friday, August 18th is casino night at the Civic Center from 6 to 11. That's benefiting the senior center here. Uh, they'll have barbecue dinner from 6 to 7.30 and casino games, et cetera. Uh, and then Friday and Saturday, October 27th through 29th is the Skylight Balloon Festival over at uh, River City Community Church Grounds. All right, thank you, sir. Next item on the agenda is announcements and recognitions by the city manager, Mr. Kessel. Mayor, council, I just wanted to say thank you for attending the uh, retreat on Friday for the budget preparation. Uh, I also wanted to extend a thank you to uh, the finance department, in particular uh, James Walters, the director, and his staff, uh, as well as the city department heads who have been working hard to put together a very good uh, budget. And uh, we look forward to the budget season, which is now upon us. Thank you, sir. Next item we have on the agenda this evening, we have a proclamation. We have a proclamation this evening recognizing and addressing uh, the Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or SJS. I'm going to come down to the podium here and read this proclamation.
So from time to time, we will uh, have proclamations that are um, as much celebratory uh, as they are, in, as in this case, informational. Um, things that we don't always hear about. And um, two comments before I start to read this. This is, again, it's, it's around, it's about Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And um, before I came in, I was, I was reading a little bit about a drug called sulfasalazine. Um, which is, uh, as I was reading about it, it says not normally given to children under the age of two today. Uh, it was given to me when I was uh, an infant, and um, I lost the entire top layer of skin on my entire body, and they said if I'd been given another dose that I would not have been expected to survive. Commonly used drug, very dangerous side effects, um, particularly for uh, infants. So. That's close to me as far as what can happen when an ordinary everyday drug is administered. Secondarily, it reads here that uh, more than 2 million Americans are hospitalized annually as, as a result of taking recommended medications, of which 140,000 are never released and eventually perish. It's a small number, but it's a significant number. When my youngest son was 11 years old, he contracted a disease called Hinachschönland purpura. Very rare. Fewer than 200,000 people a year ever contract it never heard of it, didn't know anything about it. Um, so in the same spirit of, of, of sharing what I just shared with you, I'm going to read this proclamation. We can all perhaps learn a bit from it. And it reads, whereas Stevens-Johnson syndrome, SJS, was discovered in 1922 by two pediatricians, A.M. Stevens and F.C. Johnson, after they diagnosed a child with severe ocular and oral involvement to a drug reaction. Whereas almost any medication, including over-the-counter drugs, can cause SJS, affecting people of any age, and whereas more than 2 million Americans are hospitalized annually as a result of taking recommended medications, of which 140,000 are never released and eventually perish, and whereas the most commonly implicated drugs are anticonvulsants, antibiotics, and anti-inflammatory medications, and it is generally thought that Stevens-Johnson syndrome, commonly considered a rare disease, may be more prevalent due to the lack of accurately reported cases to the Federal Drug Administration. Now, therefore, I, Michael Carpenter, Mayor of the City of Church, do hereby proclaim the month of August 2017 as Stevens Johnson Syndrome Awareness Month and call upon all citizens to show their support of the families coping with SJS and Schertz, Guadalupe County, and all communities around the state of Texas. And in witness whereof, I've hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the city to be affixed on this first day of August 2017. So, why don't you come up and you want to say a word or two? Please. This is the lady that uh, asked that we have this proclamation and, and make everyone aware of uh, what we have going on here. So please. Hi, good evening. My name is Kelly Gutierrez. Um, my child, Levi, um, suffered five years ago. He lost 85% of his skin and he is now legally blind from an allergic reaction um, to his seizure medication. It burned him from the inside out. We were treated like aliens People don't know about this, and that's what's sad, and that's what the doctors even, they misdiagnose so many times. If any, I mean, please, just, he's, he's gone through 27 surgeries in the last five years. He's far from done. Um, this is something that is, you know, con it, is, it is not contagious. It is, you know, they, he spent six months in an ICU burn center in Galveston, in Shriners Hospital. And he's, he's our miracle. He is absolutely our miracle. My, my, my child, I can't express to you, we, we lost him three times. It's just been a very, very difficult road, but he has made it and he has, he is, he's just our world. And please, educate before you medicate, please, because it could save someone you love, please. Thank you.
All right, the next thing we have on our agenda this evening, we have some new employees to recognize, and we'll start off this evening with Parks. I bet Mr. Van Zant will be coming forward. Evening, sir. I'm sorry. My mother taught me to put things back the way I found them, and clearly I learned course, very well, didn't I? Of course you did like I did. Yes, sir. Okay. <sighs> We're here this evening to introduce two new seasonal employees to the parks group, and they should be right here. If you can just sit down for a moment. Now, on the list, it says Aaron Taylor first. I'm going to go ladies first, if that's all right with everyone. Yes, sir. Um, Kathleen Nolan, who's sitting right there, is a local church resident. She has two children. Her daughter is eight years old, and her son is 11 months old. She served in the Army in the Department of Defense. And I believe, if I got this right, she was an HVAC technician. She was a firefighter and a first emergency responder for the Gardendale Fire Department. She says she is not squeamish, doesn't bother her. She has also worked for a local automobile dealership as a detailer. So she obviously shows some attention to detail, which we can definitely use. She told me this, so I'm going to quote her exactly. Her hobbies are taking care of her two children and working hard to support them. Yeah. Ask her what she enjoys. She said, I enjoy taking care of my two children and working hard to support them. So that's Kathleen. Aaron Taylor, who is seated beside her, um, he's a little bit, well, a lot of the same way in many respects. Aaron is a local church resident. He was born, however, in Las Vegas, Nevada. We won't hold that against him. He was a graduate of the Bonanza High School in Las Vegas. I'm not. If I'm lying, I'm dying. That's what he wrote down. He's been married for 17 years. His wife, her name is Danae. I had to ask him how to pronounce it because I would have never known. Together, through adoption and otherwise, they have six children. Kayla, 23. Alex, 21. Kyle, 19. Abigail, 8. Ruth, 7 and Isaiah 3. He is an experienced reserve police officer. He did that for five years. He's a retired Air Force guy with 21 years of service. He worked in military personnel as a personnelist. Now, I'm not sure that that's even a word. I had to look that one up as well. He worked as a ranch foreman for a period of two years as well. He now serves as the youth pastor at the Marion Baptist Church. So I feel very, very happy and very, very pleased to have both of them come on board with us. And now I'd like to have them come up and defend themselves, if that's okay. Kathleen, first, please. Absolutely. We offer the microphone to everyone that's duly hired. It's not required for you to speak, but it is your microphone if you wish. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm Kathleen. Um, I don't really... Okay. I don't really know what to say. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't know I was supposed to, I was gonna speak, so <laughs> No problem. But um yes, I've got two children. One's in one just got out of the hospital today. She's in there since Friday. And uh, glad she's out. Yes, and my son is eleven months old and he's you know, he's a good little boy. <laughs> and uh I did um I volunteered for the fire department for four years. And uh, I was in the Army. So. <laughs> Thank you. Well, welcome. Very glad to have you with us. <laughs> Mr. Van Zanten pretty much covered my history. Um, I like to keep myself as you, what you see is what you get. So I work hard. I believe in if you're going to do it, do it right the first time. That's my philosophy. Um, I just want to say thank you for having us tonight and your, and your time. Thank you very much. We're happy to have you on board with us. All right, next uh, department is the business office.
Good evening, council members, um, evening, sir. mayor, uh, Mr. Carpenter. Um, I'm very excited to uh, introduce um, our newest utility billing clerk, Juan, Christine Stevens. She was born in San Antonio, Texas, uh, grew up in uh, New Berlin, Texas, and attended uh, Lavernia High School. She is currently attending Texas A&M and will be graduating this December with a bachelor's in organizational, sorry, organizational leadership. And after that, she's uh, pursuing her uh, master's in business administration. Uh, her hobbies are uh, going to the beach and um, running in the park. Uh, she has a, a brother and a sister, and she is single. And that's all I have to say. Very good. Well, welcome. And again, I'll offer you the microphone. It's not required if you don't wish to, but. Hey, hi, I'm Christine Stevens. Evening. I'm really happy to be here, and thank you so much. Wonderful. Welcome. We're glad to have you on board with us. And next up, our municipal court. Good evening, Mayor, Mr. Evening. Kessel, and Council members. I am here to present to you Ms. Heather Rocha. Heather, Heather is from Polk, Texas, and uh, is a recent graduate from UT of Austin with uh, history and a minor in government. Um, on her free time, she enjoys playing co-ed softball and playing with her cats. And we in court are very happy to add her to our already wonderful staff. Thank you. Wonderful, as always, like I said, opportunity at the microphone if you'd like to say hello. Yeah, I'm Heather Rocha and I just wanna say thank you for having me here. I'm excited to, for this opportunity to serve the city of Shirts. Welcome, we're very glad to have you with us. We have our police department. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, members of council, Mr. Kessel. I have the pleasure of introducing one of our newest members to our police family, Miranda Martin. Miranda was born in San Antonio, but raised in Maiko, Texas. She attended Medina Valley High School, and upon graduation, she began her college studies and plans to continue that and finish her criminal justice degree at UTSA. She is a recent graduate from the San Antonio College Law Enforcement Academy. In her spare time, Miranda likes to spend time with her family and friends and her dog named Kane. She has a tremendous love for animals and hopes to one day uh, be a canine officer. Miranda Martin. Welcome. Good opportunity at the microphone too. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, my name is Officer Miranda Martin. Um, it's, it's been a tremendous journey to be able to stand here and wear this uniform. Um, nothing less than a dream come true. So um, I'm very honored to, to be a part of this family and to be a representation of the City of Shirts. Um, glad to be on board. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Glad to have you with us. Look forward to having a long career. All right, well next on the agenda this evening we have uh, a promotion ceremony, ceremony and it's uh, for our, our Assistant Chief Cade Long. Mr. Waite. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. We're here tonight um, to recognize the promotion of Assistant Chief Cade Long to the Fire Chief. With Chief Long this evening are his wife Terry, his three children Jordan, Ashlyn, and Colton, and also tonight, Chief Long's parents are with us, Larry and Linda Long from Elk City, Oklahoma. I'd like to ask at this time that Chief Long and his family please come down front um, and stand over here um, as we, start, as we um, start the promotion ceremony. Additionally, we're also joined in the room by a tremendous um, group of our firefighting staff from the Shirts Fire Department. And I would like to ask that, that the members of the Shirts Fire Rescue Department, even those not in uniform, I saw you back there, um, <laughs> come on up front and, and represent over here if you would. Come on, it's all right. They don't really like, you know, this kind of public recognition, so I know how they are. 
So yesterday um, was Fire Chief David Covington's last day for the city, as the Fire Chief for the City of Shirts. And today, Assistant Chief Cade Long is ready to assume the reins as the sixth fire chief in the city's history. Cade will follow in the footsteps of, of five great men that were his predecessors, Chief Archie Woodward, Chief Edward Melton, Chief Johnny Woodward, Chief Elroy Friesenhahn, and Chief David Covington. Chief Cade Long has almost 20 years of public safety experience in the fire service. He began his career as a volunteer in China Springs, Texas, he then worked for the Duncanville Fire Department for 13 years before leaving to move to Vernon, Texas to take the assistant fire chief position. And during Cade's two-year tenure in Vernon, not only was the assistant fire chief and over EMS, but he also had the opportunity to be the interim fire chief and for a short term be the interim city manager during a period of high turnover. Um, in August of 2015, the Longs relocated from Vernon to Schertz where Cade was named our new assistant fire chief. Chief Long was hired with the hope and expectation that he would be ready to lead our fire department when Chief Covington retired. And as you can see, um, Chief Long's, by Chief Long's experience, he is not one to disappoint. Chief Long is well prepared for this new promotion. He received his Bachelor of Science in Education from Southwestern Oklahoma State University in 1995 and received his teaching certificate. He has a family full of public education folks, including his mom and dad, who've dedicated their lives to that. Then, while in Duncanville as a firefighter, and while he was promoting up through captain, he obtained his master's degree in public administration from Sam Houston State University. Kate also has extensive training and education in the fire service and various disciplines within the fire service and emergency management. Tonight, as a part of this promotion ceremony, we're going to do three things. First, we're going to, um, Kate's wife, Terry, will be pinning on the fire chief badge. Then Chief Long has asked that myself and City Manager John Kessel pin on the Fire Department rank insignia, if you'd like to come down, sir. And then um, Assistant City Secretary Donna Schmuckel will swear in Kate as our new Fire Chief. So starting off with the badge pinning, the badge is a symbol of the Shirts Fire Department. Like the shields carried by the ancient knights, it carries the emblem of the land for which the wearer pledges his service. It stands for the commitment to protect and serve those within the community of shirts and wherever this promise to serve may take the wearer. In addition, the badge should remind those who put it on every day of the sacrifice of those who came before that have allowed our city and the fire department within our city to be where it is today. And, and Cade, lastly, as your wife Terry pins this badge onto your uniform, I would like to ask you to allow this every day that you put it on to remind you of the years of support and sacrifice from your family once you chose a career in, in public service. So at this time, Kate, if you and your wife would step forward. especially in front of a room full of people. Next will be the pinning on of the collar brass. The fire department, like most public safety agencies, is a paramilitary organization and the ability to recognize ranking members is critical during fire suppression, hazmat, and rescue activities. The fire department has traditionally utilized what has become known as bugles to represent the different rank levels. In the early days of the fire service, officers would traditionally use large brass speaking trumpets, or basically a megaphone type device made out of brass, to give orders to the firefighters on scene. And, they'd be, and when responding companies would arrive on the scene, they would look for the person with the, with the large speaking trumpet around their neck on a cord to know that who was in charge of the incident and who to report to for assignment. Over time, this symbol of the bugle um, of authority became the emblem used on uniforms to signify officers. And it became the tradition that the more bugles on the collar, the greater the responsibility and the greater the rank of the individual. 
The traditional fire chief rank insignia that I hold in my hand has, is a star of five bugles crossing each other. Each bugle has a specific place and each one is critical to the role of the fire chief. Chief, as these are pinned on, I would encourage you to utilize these five horns to represent the five principles of successful leadership. Number one, build trust. Build an environment within your fire department where everyone is respected and listened to. Number two, embrace conflict. Across the organization, mine for conflict and encourage constructive conflict at all levels of the department as you lead it into a new future. Number three, push for commitment. As you lead, force clarity and closure from everyone so that your vision and goals are agreed to by everyone and move forward by everyone in the department. Number four, demand accountability. Confront the difficult issues head on and do not allow anyone to not be held accountable. Demand it if you, of your command staff and lead them to do the same for the companies that they are responsible for every day. And number five, focus on results. Focus and praise collective outcomes. And as you build your team and you grow your department, always take time to celebrate your victories and successes. And Mr. Kessel, if you'd come forward, we'll pin on the collar brush. And at this time, I'd ask that Assistant City Secretary Donna Schmuckel um, come up and swear in Chief Long. In the name and by the authority of the State of Texas, I, Cade Long, I, Cade Long do, solemnly swear do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute, will faithfully execute the duties of the office of Fire Chief of the City of Shirts of the State of Texas and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, the Constitution and laws of the United States, the laws of the United States and, of this state, and of this state, so help me God. Mayor and members of council, I present to you Fire Chief Cade Long. Thank you. Chief, Thank the microphone you. is yours, sir. I'd just like to say a few words. I appreciate this opportunity. You know, I'm, I'm truly honored and, and humbled to be here tonight with all of you. Um, you know, I'd especially like to say thank you to City Manager John Kessel and Executive Director Dudley Waite for this opportunity. Um, and I appreciate that we're getting to do this in front of council and community members as well as other staff members and, of course, my family. Um, Shirts is a great community, and, and my family and I are very excited to continue um, living here and, and continuing to be part of the community. Yeah. I would like to say thanks to um, the Shirts Fire Rescue members at you know, have taken time out of their busy schedule to be here tonight with us. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of support that I've got from them, and you'd be hard-pressed to find a better group of firefighters anywhere in the country. They are the most dedicated and hardworking as you'll find, and I appreciate all that they do for our citizens uh, and our city. You know, I would also, you know, like to 
give a quick thank you to retired Fire Chief David Covington um, for all the support he's given me for the past two years and the time that he spent um, helping me for the past two years. And we truly hope that he has a great retirement with lots of fishing. Um, yes. You know, I'm, I'm truly, you know, I'm very excited to serve the citizens of Shirts um, as their fire chief. This is a very exciting opportunity for me. I'm committed to maintain the high standards that we currently have in place in the fire department. And we'll continue to do that as we move forward. Um, you know, it is our goal to continue to deliver high quality customer service to our citizens. Um, and we, when we want to do that as safely as we possibly can as well for our personnel. This endeavor takes a lot of teamwork um, along the way, and I look forward to working with all our other city departments and council and mayor as we move forward um, to do this as a team. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to say thanks to my family that has taken time out of the, their schedules, you know, to be here tonight with me. Um, they've provided me a lot of support along the way uh, to get to this point, and you know, I certainly wouldn't be here without all that support, so thank you to my family. You know, as, as we move forward, I just wanted to say thanks for all you do to the council, mayor. Um, I know you all put a lot of time and effort into this city, and I just wanted to say thanks, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. camera is following. I guess it's time for obligatory photos. Very good. I understand that. All right. Next item that we have on the agenda this evening is a hearing of residents. We didn't have anybody sign up this evening, so we'll move forward to uh, the workshops. The first workshop we have this evening is an update and discussion on the uh, natatorium arrangement with the Shirts Cibolo Universal City Independent School District. Mr. James. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just as a reminder, the city entered into an agreement with uh, SCUC ISD uh, to allow them to use the aquatics facility. And in exchange for that, they put up, I believe, $1.65 million. Uh, it's a 15-year agreement. It lays out when and how they get to use the competition pool. And then, obviously, we entered into an agreement uh, with the YMCA to operate that facility for us. Um, as you know, uh, that opened up uh, earlier this year, generally in January, and the school district began using it for the second semester of this past school year. Based on that sort of four or five months of experience, uh, staff from both the YMCA, the city, and the school district got together and said, how do we really maybe make some adjustments that are a win-win for everybody? So again, just to reiterate, the original agreement stipulated that the school district would have use of six lanes from 5.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Uh, Monday through Friday during the school year and exclusive use of the locker facility. Um, they uh, also would have use of the facility for two to four uh, swimming meets throughout the course of the year. And, and I, I think a couple of key elements when those agreements were being drafted early on before the pool was under construction. One is Council wanted to make sure that our residents had ample use of the facility so there would always be at least a couple of competition lanes open, which is why the school district only got up to six of the eight. And um, obviously the school district wanted to make sure the same thing, that for the money they were putting up that, that their students got adequate use of the facility. And then the second element was to ensure we did not have any issues with, frankly, students changing in front of the public. That was a big concern in just an area we didn't want to get involved in, which is why they had exclusive use of the locker facilities. <laughs> but as I said, after the staff of all three got together, we felt like by making some adjustments, we could really benefit everyone, the school district and the residents of Shirts going forward. Um, so what we often found is the SCUC ISD did not use the competition lanes uh, every morning. Again, they had it Monday through Friday. So some mornings they wouldn't use it at all. 
and those lanes sat empty. Other times they wouldn't use it for the four full hour window. There may be uh, different things going on at school and they'd use it for two hours and then wouldn't be used. And obviously at that point the Y would let folks start using it. Uh, but it seemed fairly inefficient use of it because the Y had to plan for lifeguards uh, to have them there just in case they couldn't, couldn't schedule uh, things for the public in the competition pool. What SCUCISD has come back with is said really to allow more opportunities for students to participate. So again, either they may be in some other activity where they have morning practices, their course schedule may not provide for it. And then I think also to allow maybe a little more attention from the coaches, what they've asked to do is sort of split up their hours of use to create an afternoon window to have swim practice as well to, to move students through. Now it may be kind of RC versus JB, it may be which students can make it or a combination going forward. Um, and then the YMCA has said, hey, if we could kind of coordinate the schedule and know when you're not gonna use it, then we can plan some things. So again, over the Christmas holiday, if you're not gonna be there and you're not gonna use it for the last week of school or that first semester, we can schedule sort of swim classes, adult events, things like that. And so, the district has said, yeah, they'll work to communicate that, to open it up again for the public, for the wide post, or even to schedule classes. And then with regard to that afternoon time, again, what we didn't want to do was block off that whole hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes, so the public couldn't use it, because we obviously, and I know we have some pool users here, have things going on in the community pool as well. What they'll really do is either have the students change in the, in the family rooms individually, or what they'll do is sort of, when all the students get there, clear the lockers, let everybody get out, block the doors, let the students go in, and as administrators and Y staff, get them moved in and out for, say, a five-minute window, open them back up to the public. And what they really think is that, while they may do that in the afternoon, most students may just go on home or head off to where they're going in their suits or however they want to do it, or use the family rooms if they want. So again, with this, what we want to make sure is that we don't prevent the public from using it that entire time in the afternoon. But again, we don't want mingling of students in the public in the locker rooms, and we think administratively they can manage that. So here's what it kind of looks like. And again, it's, it's, it's being a bit flexible with the hours. So again, what they want is generally kind of maybe Monday and Wednesday to have that 5.30 to 9.30 a.m. period normally um, with exclusive use of the lockers. But if they're not going to be there, if school's not in session for Friday, they'll make sure the Y knows it and they can open it up, things like that. If they're not gonna practice for a week because of finals, they'll let them know that and they can schedule other activities. And then Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, to reduce the time by an hour from 5.30 to 8.30, but then to pick up those afternoon sessions from 3.30 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon. Now, if you quickly are doing a calculation, that's about an extra hour and a half a week if they maximize the time. But from talking with both parties, if the school doesn't use it for an entire week, that covers almost 13 weeks of this extra hour and a half. And so again, we feel like what we can do or what we're proposing in the next one is to every year allow staffs to get together so the Y knows the primary times the public want to use the facility. City staff can ensure that it's available to the public generally the hours we want. And the school district can say based on schedules and number of students and things like that, we can adjust the time. But again, the idea is to have greater flexibility so that you're not showing up in the morning, there are a bunch of lifeguards there, the school district's not using it, and to maximize the time going forward. And so what we would do is, um, generally every year during the summer, we would all meet and determine the uh, hours, generally you know, keeping roughly the same amount throughout the course of the year and making sure that we always have those competition lanes available to the public, which was a big deal, um, and that yet we provide flexibility for both. What we've also found to be clear is they've also done a summer clinic, I think, this summer that was fairly successful. They also want to do tryouts. They may do that at the outdoor pools. Um, but what we wanted to do is come forward to you tonight, generally walk council through the concept to see if you were comfortable with that so we can go back and then likely we would come back with a modification to those hours that allows us to rework it every year uh, based on how the district needs it. And what we think we can do there is not 
have the pool go unutilized because the school district has blocked off their four hours every single morning, whether they're going to use it or not, given a little bit more flexibility in the morning and afternoon, which allows the Y to start doing some classes and things like that a bit earlier some days, and again, improve that communication so we can schedule some events going forward. Um, so again, the hours that they're asking for laid out, if they maximized, are a little bit more. But again, if they don't use it for one week because of finals, that really kind of compensates for 13 weeks of the extra hour and a half. So we think at the end of the day it balances out. What we found over the last semester is they did not use the facility as much as they could have. Um, and so, frankly, I think given how the Y has been able to manage it, staff is comfortable with this operation. So again, what we'll likely do is come back to you next week with a modification of the agreement that generally lays out Every year, staffs will get together, work that out. We can inform council of it. If we can't work it out, school district goes back to what's stipulated in the original agreement. But we think this is really a win-win. Um, the Y was comfortable with it because it lets them do the activities uh, such as early swim lessons that tend to happen right after school and right after parents get off work and want to bring their kids in to kind of maximize. So with that, I'll be quiet and answer questions. No problem. Council, questions for Mr. James? Mr. Edwards? How much of a notification, since the um, school calendars are already out, how much of a notification are you giving the Y for them to actually efficiently run their programs there? So, so the Y has been uh, meeting with the school district, and they've kind of gone through that calendar and looked. So they've kind of said, look, here's when we think we're not going to meet because of finals. Here's when we have this, that, or the other. But part of it is, even if it's two weeks in advance, they don't have to schedule lifeguards or as many lifeguards because they don't have that mass of kids. And they can post a notice on the wall going, hey, more lanes open this week or that week. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Thompson? I think the arrangement sounds very good, very flexible. The only thing um, I like to see is track the hours under the new arrangement mm -hmm. just to see how they compare to the current. And also, um, do we know when the meets are being scheduled yet? We, we do. The... the um, and again, I forgot my glasses. I walked over, so I may not, in fact, be able to read it. Uh, but the school district has sent the YMCA the meet dates they've got going forward. Okay. That's, fine. That's fine. And it's on here somewhere. But yeah, they've scheduled. You know, it's probably not going to help me. I got one really bad. Uh, so yeah, they've given those notices to when they want the meets. And again, I think this year they're going to do trials, maybe the outdoor pool, but may do it in the facility, which may take a little more. Okay. Dr. Kaiser? Uh, how many lanes would they be using in the PM hours? Six lanes as well. Six lanes so again, also. you would always have lanes open, two lanes open for the public to be able to come out and laugh. And has the Y kept any track of how many members are using the lanes at that time currently during the day? I don't know that they've got that deep. I know they track usage. So one of the issues that they work through is to not have the school district pick up peak times where they really need it for the public. Uh, but certainly what I can do is if we come back with the modifies language in the agreement, we can get a bit more detailed usage information for you at that okay. time to present. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Crawford? Mr. James, mm -hmm. when does this go into effect? The first part of the school year? They want to they start this school year. Okay. Yes, sir. And we get a report on how things are going and maybe two months or something after the start of the year, some kind of number mm -hmm. just to maybe have an idea of what is going on. I like the idea. I'm also, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say hoping in a way that the program will grow mm -hmm. and they'll be begging for more time, although I don't know that the residents would necessarily like that if they can't use the pool and they want to use it. So we do have an issue of trying to balance and this may be a good way to try to fairly and, and uh, accurately get it going on a good start. Yes, sir. We can certainly report back maybe every quarter and maybe what I'll do is um, as a good reminder, when finance comes and does the quarterly financial report, we can maybe parks have parks do some quarterly updates on usage of uh, not only the indoor pool, but the outdoor pool, the soccer complex, and baseball complex. Is, you know, get that? The first, the, the fall semester and the spring semester, as I refer to it, <clears throat> is what goes, what goes on there is kind of similar from one semester to the next. Maybe. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of asking, but I'm sort of presuming, too. The summer, is that much different or a lot different than what goes on in the fall and the spring? Is there anything in the summer that, other than maybe swimming lessons? No. Again, the way the agreement's worded originally is the school district has use of it from the start of the school year to the end of the school year. So technically, per the agreement, they don't have use in the summer. Now, what we found is that the Y, as I think we expected, and said, hey, run the facility, get it used. 
they in fact worked with the district and said, hey, let's do a, a swim clinic, good way to get it used. So I think they had a swim clinic one week that was well attended. So again, we've tried not to be overly rigid, but to your point, I think everybody understands the need to balance the community shirts residents having the ability to use the facility. And so it's a good problem to have a lot of people wanting to use it. If the program goes very, very quickly, the school district's likely going to need to figure out what they, they need to do because we can't accommodate uh, maybe as large as it might get at some point. Where, where I was going with the two questions about the semesters is maybe the middle of each semester you could give a report that kind of gives a summary of how things are going and we get an update twice a year. For the summer, do we participate in anything that Y does on a profit basis when um, they do classes? So, so no, with regard to the indoor pool, the Y, the, the pool agreement is the same as the rec center agreement, which is the Y keeps the revenue from the rec center and the indoor pool. The city keeps the revenue from the outdoor pool. So the, the nominal amount we charge, that's turned over to the city and, and we keep that. So it's a slightly different, but yeah, we can do updates twice a year, maybe at the um, uh, middle of the summer to kind of cover the spring and what's going on in the fall and then over the holiday break. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Larson. So one of the questions I had is, as we kind of look at this and determine what's best for the community, uh, I think we've heard from the city, we've heard from the school district, we've heard from the Y. I, I, I wonder if there's a mechanism we can utilize to hear from the citizens so that they could also have a, a kind of a, a voice in the decision before we make a final decision. Um, So here's what I'll, I'll perhaps. Let me give you an out. Okay. Well, okay. I'll take it. Because I swim in that pool, and I go at different times during the week. So when everyone else is finished, I'll tell you my thoughts on it as a resident and user of the pool. Okay. We'll start from there. That, that's a start, but it's I'd a, like to hear maybe a little bit more community as well. Sure. So, <laughs> absolutely. So, so I'll offer this up. Um, you know, we certainly informally do get comments from the public uh, about issues either at the rec center or the outdoor pools, the indoor pools, baseball and soccer, and we've, we've heard things like that as to when kind of peak times are. Again, we've kind of gone over there, city staff swims over there and we hear from them um, as well. Um, I, I think perhaps I would suggest this. We look to Councilwoman Kaiser's comments about maybe some more detailed statistics on the usage to give you a better feel. Um, while I think you're right, the public needs to have a voice. Um, very often with many of these things, everybody's got their own particular opinion and I think the struggle is to try to get a broad basis as opposed to maybe just hearing from the person who's frustrated about a particular. Um, so perhaps what we need to do as a suggestion going forward, and I would offer this up not just for the natatorium and the rec center, but the outdoor pools, baseball and soccer, is maybe work with the parks board to create some mechanism to better survey our residents in terms of how these are being used. We got that a bit um, when we did the parks master plan in terms of asking folks what they needed and then again with the citizen survey. But I'm sure we could work with the why to better survey the users and then they would share that data with us and then we could present it to council as well to give you a feel. Very good. Anyone else? Mr. James. Yes, sir. I'll come talk to you about that later. Okay. Because I think that's a good idea. We, council needs to hear from the people. Yes, sir. We have some people here now, but we don't have enough. Yes, sir. And anything they want to say about anything about the city, the pools, the soccer fields, particularly quality of life, but even budgets. We have our three budget meetings. The more we can get the people involved, the better the city can be. If yes, they don't sir. tell us, we don't know. Agreed. I mean, the, Americans, the mayor goes to the pool, and I don't. I will have to at some point in time because my knees will die on me or, so, or fade or whatever they do. <laughs> But uh, it is important to hear from our city rep city residents. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Maybe we can let just maybe we can just have the why poll the membership, okay. the people that are using it, and just simply give them an opportunity to talk about how it's working. Uh, they're there, they're using it, they're present. I, I have a feeling they'll be rather outspoken, uh, having met a lot of the group as I've been going to the pool. What I will say is this: I, I haven't run into a time where I've had to wait more than 10 minutes to have a lane to myself. 
regardless of what's going on, whether it's swimming lessons, whether it's the uh, uh, Zumba class, even, even when, and I learned a new term, and I think it's okay for, for here, even when the community pool is closed because of a code brown, you might figure out what that is. Even when that happens, I've not had trouble finding a lane. And here's the other thing that's really cool that happens when our residents are there and they're using the lanes that are available. Typically two to three are being used for swim lessons for the kids in the evenings and there's two to three lanes available for the residents. We share lanes. We'll, we'll, we'll follow. One will take off, we'll follow, a third will follow, and we'll share lanes and make it work for everybody. So uh, I, would, I would say let, let the folks that are making use of the facility give us some commentary about how it's working for them, maybe even open it up for them to make suggestions, have the Y coordinate that. We, uh, uh, we, we pay some money for them to run that facility for us. I think that's the something they should be able to do. Um, and uh, I, I haven't heard anything negative while I've been there uh, in the pool. Now granted, you might say that's because you're underwater part of the time, so you're not hearing everything. But uh, I, I've received a lot of compliments from folks about uh, how the pool's running, and, uh, and I think the Y is doing a very good job for us. And they even get the pool open again by the next day when they have a code brown. So those things said, anyone else comments on this particular item? I, I think we're good. Thank you, Mr. James. All right, um, got to have a little humor. Life's short. Next item we have on the agenda this evening, we have discussion regarding the proposed, you know what, I tell you, let's, let's do this. I, I think a lot of the folks that are here this evening are uh, interested in um, a particular item that we have on the agenda, and I believe that is item number six, which is, um, so if the council doesn't mind, I'm going to move to item number six. We'll come back and take care of some of the other business. But item number six is resolution 17R54, a resolution by the city council of the city of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Celrico Services to provide the meals for the congregate meal program at the Shirts Area Senior Center. Tom Tangler. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Van Zant. Back again, Mr. Mayor, members of the Good council. Good evening. City Manager, we're going to tag team you this evening because this is a very important issue. It affects a lot of people, mm -hmm. and we've done a Let's lot. Let's come up to the microphone a little closer. There you go. I'm sorry. Yeah. We've done a lot of work, a lot of staff review, a lot of... Um, um, One second. Thanks for joining us tonight, gentlemen. Glad to have you with us. We've done Hands a lot in. of individual soul searching to make sure that we come up with the right solution to the problem. So that being said, uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation for you, which is highly unusual from me. So I'm going to let Ms. Shrum kind of help us run through this. It really is kind of a chronology of what we've been doing at the Senior Center in terms of the Congregate Meal Program beginning in May of 2010. And as it says, City of Shirts entered into an operating agreement with the Comal County Senior Citizens Foundation. The foundation was to provide one lunch meal five days per week. The initial term of the operating agreement was for a period of 29 months, or two years plus the gap between May and the end of the fiscal year at $3,500 a month for a total of $101,500. On October 12th of 2010, the operating agreement between the City of Shirts and the Comal County Senior Citizens Foundation was amended so that the term of the agreement was extended through September 30th of 2015. What's the magic? Oh, next. That's magic. Now, City of Shirts gets involved. Following a series of unforeseen events, the City of Shirts took over the management and provision of the congregate meal for the Shirts Area Senior Center, effective January of 2014. And staff worked with local restaurateurs to provide a variety of meals at no cost, at a cost, excuse me, to the seniors of $4 per meal. I think that many of you will probably, or at least some of you will remember that, uh, where we uh, did, we had a variety of restaurateurs that, that got involved with us in that effort. Some would deliver, some wouldn't, but staff made sure those things happened. This means of meal delivery was in effect for a period of about one year. During that time, congregate meal participation languished, and I used that, I thought about that word, I thought that was a good word to describe it, between 25 and 40 participants per day. Long button. Following a series, oh, excuse me, you've been too fast? Okay. 
Now, this brings in the Community Council of South Central Texas, CCSCT. In December of 2014, staff discovered, discovered and contacted the Community Council of South Central Texas. They indicated that they could provide the congregate meal at no charge. Okay. However, enrollment of the individual seniors in the program was required. So, City of Shirts has no contract with CCSCT. The enrollment is what takes care of that. Our members are enrolled in the program and that's, that's how uh, they account for that. Staff successfully collected the enrollment forms uh, for, from the seniors and passed them along to the CCSCT to enroll them in the program in, in, in January 2015 and the seniors and the city began to receive the congregate meal at no cost. In February 2015, CCSCT lost their ability to provide the meals at no cost and was forced to begin to charge the City of Shirts $4.38 per meal delivered. The City was not made aware of this change until June of 2015 by attempting to back, by CCSCT's attempting to back bill the City for the charges. That's what brings us around to the RFP process. Since the City of Shirts has no contract with CCSET, the City, Parks, the City and the Parks Department was advised very strongly uh, that the creation of a service agreement was of the utmost importance. An RFP was initiated by the Department to seek out other vendors and organizations that could provide the same or better service. The RFP closed on March 23, 2017. We had three respondents. A staff panel consisting of the Parks Director, the Assistant Parks Director, and the Environmental Health Manager, by the way, that's, that's Jesse Hamilton, by the way, in case you didn't know. Um, so we were, the, we were the discovery panel. A taste test panel on July 11th of 2017 involved members from the Senior Center Advisory Board as well. That was one of the criteria that was, that was used in this selection process. So I can't read that. So I'm going to ask Lauren to read this, if she would, please. Okay, so then throughout this RFP process, um, we scored this and we did the taste test panel. And you can see maybe here uh, the scoring. We just wanted to include that. Cell Rico Services uh, was the top score of 96.06. San Antonio Food Bank was second highest score at 84.17. And the Community Action Partnership, which is another name for the CCSCT that currently provides our meals, scored in at 47.61. Um, and we, we had a couple of evaluation notes there where we um, looked at their delivery efficiency and um, their safety health plan and things like that. And in fact, in some of the photos that, that were submitted in the RFP process, we were able to even spot violations of the health code right there in the photo. So that kind of made it easy uh, throughout the process. But that's the process we went through and so we are recommending that the um, congregate meal program be awarded to Celrico Services for the Shirts Area Senior Center. Uh, we are currently experiencing an average meal count of approximately 68 meals per day. Uh, we are anticipating that when we move into the newly renovated Senior Center, uh, that will draw in some more folks. Um, we will offer a better tasting food. The word will get out from our panel members that the food is better. Um, and we will have better meal delivery service. Uh, so we're anticipating a, a little bit of a rise in our program, and uh, that is what the not to exceed contract amount is based on, the number of 100 meals per day. And then uh, going forward, staff is gonna work to pursue reimbursement for this program uh, and to get some of the funding through the Department of uh, Aging and Disability Services that's funneled through the ACOG. So that's our goal. So that's the brief history. We're here to answer any questions. Questions. All right, council questions for uh, these kind folks. Mr. Davis? Yes. Um, do we have a breakdown on how many non shirts residents use the facility? We had a breakdown about a year ago. I was having a breakdown after that. The, the, uh, we, did a, we did a meal count participation. At that time, uh, Shirts residents accounted for about 53 percent, and then there were other local cities, uh, Cibolo, uh, Selma, 
Live Oak, Marion. Uni Marion, Universal City, that broke down the other essentially half. 47 percent? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, on your previous slide, where it says that last um, bullet, where it says staff will pursue, or pursue reimbursement options through those other agencies, have we considered any reimbursement options through our surrounding communities, much like we do with um, reimbursement for the library and other facilities in the city of Shirts? Actually, we have considered that. We just haven't gotten that far in this process. Mr. Crawford? Y'all are going to consider that, right? I mean, y'all are going to pursue yes, that sir. and see what happens. That's correct. Okay. Is the um, contribution by the Texas Department of Aging and Disability Services and AAC of governments, is that, do they provide enough that makes a difference? Can they make up differences that help in case we do grow to be more than 100 meals a day, which yes. is what's funded now? Yes. They have the capacity, yes. All right. And they would? They would. Good. Thank you. Again, let me, if I may add, because there's a cap. If we needed to go beyond that cap, that amount of money, then we would have to come back to council for the request for additional funding. If, if I may, and, and sometimes it helps to be able to listen to the questions. Um, we can apply to those for funding. I will say that maybe contrary to how I interpreted the answer, there is a lot of demand for that funding. Yes. And frankly, when our initial operator ran into some problems, some unforeseen, that was in large part due to their inability to provide free meals. Again, the current provider, it was a reduction in funding. So there are a lot of agencies going after that money that's divvied up. I think there are substantial amounts that can help bring down the city's cost. But to be very clear, it is very, very competitive, and I don't think anybody gets as much money as they want or need. Yes. And I just wanted to make that. Yes, that, that makes sense in, in the scheme of, of dollars. Are, have, has any, is anybody working with other cities or other cities working with other cities to get money to reimburse if they have programs? Or are we trying something new by trying to do that? Or does anybody know? It's, it's not a penalty question. It's just a, yeah, how are we trying to fund things if we do have an increased really interest? Something that's necessarily new. I think it's just are looking at different avenues and different ways of, of handling the program. These will be things that we'll be trying to pursue as well going forward. Thank you. Mr. Gutierrez. Well, first, I'd like to thank our mature citizens for taking the time to join us here today. I appreciate the participation in this matter brought before the City Council. And although most of you may consider it just a meal, it's more than that. Lunch also provides the nutrients and also provides the opportunity to make new friendships and also share significant memories. And thank you again for your involvement in this issue. Um, you indicated there was three city employees that participated in the taste That's testing. Correct. How many uh, partici participants from the senior center participated? We involved them directly in the tasting portion of the selection because that's really, in the end, that's really what they're the most concerned with. So we involve members of the, of the Shirts Area Senior Center Advisory Board in that process. Any idea how many? Yes, there, there were five. 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 Thank you. Mr. Thompson. The meal program is very important. Um, found this out firsthand when my wife was the director of the senior center. Um, the idea of going to Selma and Cibolo and other um, governments was brought forward by her at that time. And one of the arguments against that was, well, s the budgets are already set. So one of the ideas that Donna had at that time um, was to go before each of those city councils once a quarter and just give an update on the number of citizens from that particular community who had been using it, not necessarily asking for the money, but just saying, by the way, in case you'd like to budget this for the next fiscal year, here's how many, and just keep going back every quarter with the indication that, oh, by the way, your citizens are still, you know, and um, I think if we're uh, if Selma or Cibolo were locked into the fiscal budget for the next year and they said no, this might be a way of saying we understand, but we'd like, we're like we going to prepare you for a year to start adding it to your next fiscal budget. Uh, that in mind would, that if it's 40 something, that could 
cut the cost in half to shirts, and the reason that might be important is in my next two questions. Number one, what mechanisms in the contract are there for the cost increase of the meals? Food goes up, labor goes up, and all of a sudden, Sal Rico comes back and says, oh, by the way, it wasn't this, it's really this now. The second question is, what mechanism in there is for the number of seniors using the meal increasing? If we're charging for planning for 100, and all of a sudden, it's so good, which we would like to have that problem, um, that 150 seniors start showing up, you know, so um, there is no uh, price increase allowed in the contract. It is a set price for the two-year contract period. So that takes care of that question at this point. Um, what we would do to manage the program is we would have the seniors, um, they would have to be members, obviously, to come in and get the lunch. And the procedure would be much like it is now, where they sign up in advance and have a ticket to get their meal. Um, and if we got to the point where we were seeing numbers that were looking like we were going to reach our mark, um, we would have to come together as a staff and come back to council and discuss that at that time. But, you know, we don't know what kind of numbers we're going to see. So because I know the history when Donna was there was that when the quality of the food, the number of lunches increased, the quality of food decreased, the number decreased. So hopefully if this is as good as they say they are with a high score, we're going to see a positive problem for the city of Shirts and maybe the citizens of Selma and Sybil to go to those city councils too. Is there some reason that, because I know this has been a problem, you know, just looking at this for several years with the meals, and I do agree, they, we need to have something in place um, for the senior center. Why, if this problem has been going on for so long, haven't you already approached some of the other cities? That's a good question. Chuck and I have worked on this, and I think we've been through a number of things. One of the problems that we've had, or there are really a couple of issues. One is the state of the program seems to fairly often be in flux. Um, and maybe it's wishful thinking that we sort of get to a point of stability. We have some solid numbers. We have some solid attendance. We have some solid costs. Uh, and then can go forward with a, with a particular amount to request. Um, I think a bit of one of the other problems we ran into is as we've listed some of the cities that um, we provide services to operate senior centers as well. And so there's a bit of a challenge there. The numbers may not quite match, but we do get folks from San Antonio using our facility. City of San Antonio operates facilities. And so there's a bit of an issue. Now, there are just a couple of there. Um, we also have some that are out in the county, doesn't have that. And I, I think, as I recall, the, the biggest number was clearly Cibolo. Yes. Um, so as I recall. And so, frankly, that's really, I think, the city that we probably need to sit down with and deal with, uh, much as we've tried to maybe formalize some of our library funding agreement and things like that and some other use agreements. I think that's where we'll get the most bang for our buck. Um, I don't know that, frankly, some of the cities like Garden Ridge and Marion really have enough to warrant it. But to be blunt, it's probably a city of Cibolo issue that we need to sort of deal with where you will see the most bang for your buck. The last thing I'll say is some of the problems we've had is with regard to the grant funding that the current provider was getting and the previous provider had and that we have come with strings attached. So one of the things that you often have is if you achieve grant funding, you can't charge for the meals, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And so one of the problems is it puts you in a bit of an all or nothing situation, uh, with, which is the other thing we've talked about, which is charging non-residents uh, a portion as well would be a way to recoup that cost going forward. Um, so I think not good reasons, but those are sort of the issues we've dealt with up to this time. I, I just think it would have been prudent to do that. Yes, ma'am. Prior. Hold on, Mr. Larson hasn't had a shot yet, Mr. Larson. Well, um, I want to say thank you for putting this proposal together. And so there's there's conflicting parts of me now, right? Because obviously this is a critical uh, service. In fact, when I talk with residents that utilize it, they love it. But we have to admit it is expensive. Um, I think it's worth the investment, absolutely. So there's no question there. I just kind of want to issue a, a challenge because I know y'all are up for it because I've seen the great work that y'all have done this year with receiving that grant for the trails and with putting together this RFP. Um, I think adding some, a two-year contract gives us some stability. So if this is passed by council, I, I'd really like to, to challenge you to find creative 
ways to get this fully funded by the time we renew the contract so that we don't have to turn away any who I don't care if they're search residents or not if they're coming here for a lunch they they want the social interaction they want the food um, yeah we should ask other cities to, to pony up but I don't think it should be dependent on that and so I'd like to see us not only the the programs you've mentioned but other cities private partnerships that are part of our communities I mean there's there's businesses that are invested in our community uh, I think this is a worthy cause and so I, I want to say thank you for putting this together and just issue a, a challenge in, in public that when it's time to renew this contract uh, let's let's have public private partnerships that make it at no cost to the seniors and at minimal or no cost to the city of shirts yes sir mr. Thompson come right back to you mr. Edwards. my question um, was and this is just a question if we approach Cibolo, some other cities, would it be more of a charge per citizen or more of a donation to underwrite the entire program? Would that skirt around the grant in a legal way? Not, not necessarily. I mean, I think, so let me kind of lay out a fundamental issue, and this, again, is just one of those things that's made this a challenge. When we've discussed this, I think everybody struggles, as Councilman Larson, even our seniors, to say, yeah, shirts his foot in the entire bill and yet there's been a big push not to turn anyone away or not to make folks not feel welcome uh, ironically as we sat today in the meeting to discuss the time frame of the senior center renovations being completed and trying to get seniors back in I think everyone was keenly aware of the heat we've been experiencing and again I think particularly for seniors having some place to go during the hottest point of the day that's air conditioned is a big Bennett so that's been a big struggle as we've tried to work through the funding is not to make folks not feel welcome um, you know we can certainly do a better job with this I think what we found a little bit with some of our other agreements with communities to support funding has been um, not as quantitatively based there are an infinite number of ways you could probably do that um, but again as we've seen with the library funding agreement uh, particularly with the Cibolo one there's not as much of a formula to it it's just kind of the amount that's built um, and so again I think perhaps if we can uh, demonstrate once folks go back into our new facility that's been renovated perhaps for the ribbon cutting of that we can invite the councils of the nearby communities whose seniors attend and that can be a good way for them to see the money that Schertz has put into it hear from their residents and things like that and we can work up some mechanism because you're right even if there's not a quantitative formula for it if we can get ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars from Cibolo that's ten or twenty thousand dollars to go to the program even if it's a, more of an arbitrary amount mr. Edwards mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve resolution 17 r 54 second with the not to exceed amount of one hundred and four thousand dollars second I have a question just a second. Someone else said second before Mr. Edwards finished. Mr. Gutierrez, you agree with the way he finished his motion? Yes, sir. So we have a, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Crawford? I have a question. I have no desire to not do what we're doing. And y'all can't think of all the questions we're going to ask. I'm not trying to yell and scream. But we do absorb costs and pay bills to make this happen and since I am a senior citizen but I don't need to come to the senior citizen center to eat I have an interest when y'all were doing the determination of where somebody lives two years ago or so whenever it was was that a difficult process or an easy process did they answer your question if you asked where they lived or was it I didn't I don't I mean I don't, I'm not I don't want it to be offensive but I'm just wondering can we, is it easy to track or difficult to track and yes yeah the answer to your question is it yes and uh, most it, people will voluntarily offer that that information if you had 10 people readily. from civil that's not a big deal but if you had 40 people from civil that might be a big deal every day i don't know yeah, i was just going to add there's actually a membership process they have to apply to be a member and so on that form it lists okay. where they live yes, so, and so we're able to collect that data fairly easily and just to add to what mr larson said we have already started looking at other funding sources and i just found out recently WellMed, who used to be a neighbor in the senior center, actually offers funding for senior centers. So we're going to look into that. Some, some things, and we, we take all these numbers into this funnel, and we funnel it down, this number of poops out in your hand, it's not always the right number. Sometimes it's a bunch of poop. So we have to have the right number, 
and have an understanding. Some things we have to pay for because it's worth doing. And this may be one of them. Yes, sir. In spite of the questions we ask that take time and maybe a little bit on the offensive side, we still need to know what we're paying for. Because we as taxpayers, at least those of us sitting up here for sure, have an interest in trying to spend the money correct. That's what our job is. Y yes, sir. I, I certainly think that's the case. As Mr. Van Zandt and Mr. Strum said, uh, we have some pretty good stats in terms of where folks good. live and where they participate. Uh, I will say this, and we can probably do a better job seeking other funding sources, yeah. other communities, et cetera. I don't want to underestimate that one of the issues that we have been very cautious of that we've seen to be an issue is making sure that everyone feels welcome at the senior center. And so even when we talk about it, we're careful the language we use so that residents know of every community, they're welcome at the senior center. And I think, frankly, I'll give you, we, we can do better at it, but this is a role that shirts the sort of the biggest suburban community has said, we're gonna take on and we're gonna take on for folks who may not have another option in the area. We'll work together, but we will be very, very cognizant to make everyone feel welcome while we're going through that and regardless of the outcome. Mr. James, I'm not saying y'all aren't doing a good job. I'm saying that I didn't yes, realize sir. the number of intense moving parts that put this together. I probably do on a conceptual basis, but when you start talking about all these things and other cities being involved and how do you get things paid for, and how do you be nice to people, it becomes not a casual little issue. That's, that's correct. And I how think, did you get older? I, I agree with that. And again, I think keep in mind that part of how we're looking to grow the center is not just have a window of four hours when there are a lot of people there, but early in the morning folks show up, there are a lot of people, and they're there till closing till we're pushing them out the doors with the renovated facility. Thank you. All right, I have a uh, motion from Mr. Edwards, a second from Mr. Gutierrez. Uh, any comments or questions from council? I just, I just want to say one thing, guys. We do, we, we do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Go back five, six years from now, and, and when we did not have a senior center years ago and, and it was being thought and being planned and hoped and dreamed for, it's kind of like Noah's Ark. You know, at least we're not drowning. You know, we have a lot of things that go on inside that ark, but guess what? It's watertight. At least we're doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Aye. 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 Thank you. I have uh, seven ayes and no nays. And before we move on from this, I I'm going to make a little comment here. Yeah, you can go ahead and clap. That's good. It makes sense. <laughs> and um, and I, I want to be very careful not to sound in any way like, like I'm chiding the council. That's, that's not my objective at all. This council gives of their time, um, and, and it's a lot of time. Um, but I... In going back and reading minutes and looking at the history of the city and, and recently uh, having some old photo albums found and, and, and going back and looking at what happened long before any of us were serving, um, and I'll use the, the library, which is now the Senior Center, as an example. You go back and you look at the photographs, and what you don't find there is a predominance of city staff doing the work or a predominance of the residents doing the work. You see most of the members of the council with their sleeves rolled up and doing painting and carrying in furniture and participating in the work. So I would encourage every member of this council, if you think finding alternate ways of funding this is important, go out and take a look and see what you can find. You might be surprised. And you might be surprised what your conversations with your colleagues and peers in other cities might bring to you. And you might be surprised what would happen if that came before the Northeast Partnership, whether or not that would be an organization that might want to, want to, want to participate, or, or, the, or Guadalupe County, don't know. But I would encourage you to go out and, 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 and make a contribution to the fight. And, and to quote from the movie from uh, uh, Biloxi Blues, any fight, whichever one you believe in. All right, we're going to move on to the next item. And that's, con that's continuing with workshops. We're on the second workshop at this point. This is a discussion regarding the proposed FY 2017-18 City of Shirts fee changes. Mr. Walters, do you have this one or is it Mr. James? Mr. Walters. Very good. Mr. James Walters. Sir. Yes, <laughs> I did say Mr. Walters or Mr. James because it says it here. It says B. James or J. Walters. Well. 
guess in this case, we're going to be James Walters. Sir. Uh, this year, we're presenting the fee schedule in a little bit different fashion. Normally, in the past, we've given council the fee schedule with the council packet, and we have an item on the next agenda to take action at that time. This year, what we're doing to give council a little bit more time to review the fee schedule, come up with questions, and come back and ask us. We're holding a workshop now, do a brief overview of what's in there, answer any questions you may have right off the bat. Next week, you'll have the full council packet with the CCM um, additional background information, and any questions uh, that you still have remaining, we'll be back to answer those. Uh, this year, uh, since we're adding new fees, um, there are, it will have to be done by ordinance, so there'll be two readings, so we're going to talk about this for three weeks, so we have plenty of time to look at it, review, and ask questions. Um, I say that now because if, if we were just changing fees, we could do that by resolution. The ordinance allows for that. But any fee that we want to add or set, um, we come back to council for an ordinance. Uh, so the fee schedule is reviewed once per year with the budget and tax rate discussion. Uh, our rates are reviewed and compared to um, either related expenses, if they're tied together in some way, or similar offerings in other areas to make sure we're compatible with um, what other communities have. So I want to touch on the, uh, the major changes first, the ones with the largest impact. Uh, the utility rates, the garbage rates increased 3%, the water rates increased 3%, and the sewer rates increased 6% in the proposal. So the garbage rates increased 3%. The impact on the average customer is about 36 cents. Uh, this is the final scheduled increase of an eight-year rate contract initiated with bare waste. So the contract calls for about 3% increases every other year. So for 16, 17, we, had, we didn't change the rates, but then for 17, 18, under the contract, we would. Um, their rates take effect uh, January 1st, and since Republic Services has taken on the entire franchise agreement and all the contracts and all this, they essentially are bare waste. Um, we'll continue this uh, for that final year with them and then come back and revisit uh, future <coughs> changes. Uh, the second rate we want to talk about is the water rates. Rates in the proposed document increase uh, 3%. The impact on the average water customer would be about uh, $1.60. This follows the five-year rate plan provided by the Will Dan consultants that spoke to, uh, to council on July 11th. Uh, the cost of water will increase with the additional debt service being issued by SSLGC currently to develop the uh, Guadalupe well field. Um, and by 2022, you'll see uh, in Will Dan's presentation, and there will be a copy of that provided to you uh, for next week, um, the debt service from CC or, uh, SSLGC um, jumps about $1.7 million to pay for all of that. Uh, so the rates, instead of waiting until 2022, going up all at once, uh, we felt a stair-step approach was uh, more appropriate. Uh, the sewer rates, the rates increased 6%. The average impact on the customer of $1.91. This also followed the five-year rate plan provided by the Will Dan consultants. Uh, this rate is higher than the water rate um, because it's following a different pattern. When we first contracted with uh, Economist.com back then, who is now Will Dan, uh, they found that our sewer fees were not covering the cost of providing sewer service. Um, so we had, in the past, much higher rate hikes, and we're getting to the point where we're starting to level off. So when we first did this, we found um, a, a huge gap, and rate increases were in the tune of 30% increases. Um, now the five-year recommendation is back down to a 6%. Um, a quick estimate on the, on the bottom here shows the sewer <laughs> revenue budget for 16-17 was $4.9 million, but uh, the estimated sewer expense budget was $5.8 million. So we're closing that gap so that the water rates aren't subsidizing uh, sewer um, costs. And I'll... Um, we can take any questions over the utility rates now, or if there's any reason uh, we can hold off and review them. Yes, sir. Mr. Thompson? I presume that when you're using these numbers, it's per month? Yes, it's so per month. So in essence, we're asking our residents about a $47 increase per year between the three. Yes. OK. okay. I'm 
hand it over to uh, Linda Klepper to go over the Civic Center uh, fees, which we consider the last um, material fee adjustments in the, in the fee schedule this year. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So for the Civic Center fees, um, uh, this year we took a really good look at uh, the current fees that we have in the Civic Center. Um, upon some review, I discovered that uh, the last time we raised uh, rates in our facilities was in 2008-2009. Um, and prior to that, uh, the facility opened in 2006. Um, and then that slight increase in fiscal year 2008-2009 uh, was the last time we raised any rates. Um, since then, however, we have increased services. Um, costs have increased to maintain uh, and keep up the facility uh, to the expectations of the renters. Um, we've also added, well not added, but we created the event attendant position uh, last fiscal year. So there are three positions that were converted from general services who provides um, a lot of our support to the buildings as far as uh, janitorial um, support. Uh, we converted three of those positions to dedicate them or further dedicate them to uh, the event facilities. Um, so as we have increased um, rentals over the years, uh, so has the demand that we provide a higher level of service. Um, so having that body, that person there that can answer a question for a renter um, has become a key thing that, that we felt uh, providing the renters uh, was helpful. Um, and then we, of course, reviewed the area of venues around us. Uh, we want to make sure we're keeping up with the market uh, and remain comparable and competitive to those around us. Um, and of course, going forward, um, I would like to continue to evaluate the rates each year just to make sure that we're staying uh, within that market and uh, remaining comparable. So just kind of a breakdown of the fees. So you'll see a little bit more on the fee schedule because we do have the banquet package. Um, however, the banquet package is directly related to the rental fee, the base fee, as well as the ancillary fees. And so these changes will impact the banquet package. However, without these changes, the banquet package wouldn't change. Um, so in the ballroom on Fridays and Saturdays, looking at going from 1600 to 1800 Sundays 700 to 800 and Monday through Thursday 500 to 600 The cutoff hall, which is going to be a little more than half of the ballroom, uh, Friday and Saturdays we offer it at 1200 and we're recommending 1400 Sunday 500 to 600 Monday through Thursday 325 to 425 and then in our blue bonnet hall uh, which we did increase the rate in the blue bonnet hall on the Friday and the Saturday last year so that one we did a $75 increase from 500 to 575 last year we're just asking for that other 25 to round that out to 600 and then Sunday 300 to 400 Monday through Thursday, 225 to 250. Uh, the large stage has previously been rented at $200, so we have a small stage and a large stage, and both have been charged the same amount, but they are not equal when uh, setting up as far as staff time that's needed. Uh, the large stage is very heavy, needs about three staff members, takes a couple of hours to set up, a couple hours to stare down. Small, ta small stage takes about one or two people, and they can do it in about half an hour to an hour on either end. Um, so we're asking for that rate increase on the large stage uh, to more appropriately recoup the cost of staff time that is needed to set that stage up. Um, AV in the Blue Bonnet Hall, currently we charge $25 for that, uh, looking at charging 50 for the AV. Um, the portable bar and tables, uh, this is an amenity that a lot of folks tend to ask for when they rent our facilities. Uh, we do not offer a, a bar, just a basic kind of stand for them, um, and a lot of folks do ask for that. Um, so we thought maybe creating a portable bar and getting some cocktail tables as a package um, for $200 would be reasonable, and then we would add that to the banquet package as well. So that's where that $200 in the banquet package that you'll see the increase not only from the rental fee, but also that $200 for the portable bars. Um, and then we also are proposing three additional fees uh, that really uh, would benefit certain groups within our community. Uh, HOA meetings, um, a lot of HOAs come and, and visit us and use our facilities. Um, we want to just be able to provide them a low cost uh, place for them to meet. $75 for a three hour max. They're usually in and out between 6 and 8 p.m. Not a lot of setup required. Um, it's just chairs, no tables. Uh, so it's very easy for us to accommodate them. 
uh, quality of life events. So in the community center, we have our senior line dancers, and they come in every Tuesday from 9.30 in the morning until about noon. Uh, they do some line dancing in there. Uh, they were doing clogging. I don't know if they're still doing that. Um, and then we also have Sweet Sensations, the Baton Twirlers group, and then we have some, a couple of basketball groups that come in and use the community center throughout the day. Um, those quality of life events offer another program and service to our residents, so we'd rather not charge them uh, an exorbitant fee for the community center and the North Center, which are recreational. Uh, so we're recommending $15 for a three-hour use of just those two facilities for those types of events. And then the funeral reception, a three-hour max for $75. So uh, we've also noticed uh, an increase in funeral reception requests. Uh, these types of events are not planned, usually months out, um, and they're usually letting us know a couple of days beforehand. If that room is not booked, we would have not booked it really anyways, and so we just see that uh, as an opportunity to provide that service to them at a lower cost uh, during their time that they're going through that. I think I covered everything. Okay. Any questions? Council questions. Mr. Larson. So I have some questions on the Civic Center fees. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it, it's only fair to tell you the philosophy that's driving the questions. But uh, the Civic Center belongs to the citizens of Shirts. They've paid for it. And so I, I wonder, one, in terms of uh, the percentage of events booked, do we have any tracking of if it's a Shirts resident or not a Shirts resident? So we do track that information. I don't have that information with me. It's just as simple as me clearing out uh, a report on Excel and I can tell you that. Uh, it's pretty fairly balanced. So we do see a lot of folks from San Antonio. I will say uh, they're probably the, the next biggest user if shirts isn't. Um, a lot of San Antonio, a lot of Cibolo, a lot of Garden Ridge, a lot of Live Oak. Um, uh, we are a, a pretty uh, balanced uh, uh, facility as far as needs so we can accommodate smaller events larger events so I feel like a lot of folks from different areas who need that come and see us I can run that report and give that to you guys if that's helpful That'd be great and then in terms of the the plus minus budgetary wise finances wise uh, on an annual basis what are we looking at our expenses for managing the Civic Center greatly exceed our revenues or vice versa what, what does that look like so the uh it does, the expenses currently do exceed um, based on personnel. If it was not including personnel, it would be uh, um, pretty much a wash. So it's not quite covering everything, but uh, it, it gets close. And I guess in terms of, like, let's say a ballroom Saturday event, um, does our, our cost of operating and staff exceed $1,600? Or is the cost, the annual cost, just because of all the other additional back-end administrative I guess, and so ultimately, I think it's important that we have the market price factored in for non-residents. For me, it's hard to use market prices as a factor for residents, if that makes sense. I think our costs should be driving, and is it possible to have a, a discounted rate for a church resident that might reflect their continual investment into the Civic Center? So at one point there was a resident discount offered. I'm not sure, I can't speak to why that was removed or uh, when that was removed. Um, but I do feel that it was hard to track in that some people would bring an aunt or a cousin who lives in the city of Shirts, have them sign the contract so they could get the rate discount. But then that person wasn't actually present the night of the event. And so when dealing with the renter or the person who signed the contract, you have that issue of they're not even present during the event and they're held, they're the ones that are held to all of the terms and conditions, kind of fighting that. I will say in my research into area venues, there was only two out of eight that offered a resident discount. New Braunfels does not offer one, Garden Ridge does, Windcrest does, Seguin doesn't. Um, you know, so there's various ways that venues handle it, but some do and, and then some don't. So. And then just to understand, are we currently allowing homeowners association meetings in our facilities? Yes. And the, are they not being charged, or what are they being charged currently? Ninety-eight seventy-five. I believe. Okay, so it's, this is actually a reduction. Yes. And it, I'm assuming then that's the same for the quality of life events. Yes. 
Okay. And the funeral receptions, we've been charging about 75 because we don't have a rate for that, but we'd like to set that rate. Uh, the 98.75 is the half day in the Blue Bonnet Hall minus the 25%, which we would give to HOAs. So. Okay. Well, that, that's good then. That, lowering those rates is, is a positive. So, absolutely. Thank you very much. Mr. Crawford? On the items on our packet that y'all gave us, it says deleted. That means there's no charge, but the service is still available? Or does it mean you're not providing that space at any charge? That means it's been removed, the service has been removed, and the charge has been removed. So, so you, you, can't. you will see the conference package. That was one thing I didn't touch on. The conference package, we are removing. Uh, the conference package didn't really offer any incentive. The banquet package bundles uh, the amenities, the popular amenities, um, with the rental rate, but it also gives them a little bit of a break. So maybe they'll get some free ice, so they won't pay for that $15 in ice, or maybe they won't pay that 25 or 75 in AV if you bundle the package because you're renting more. We didn't want to nickel and dime our customers, per se. We heard that a lot before the banquet package was created. However, the conference package was just a collective, here's all the rates added together and here's what you're going to pay. So there was really no incentive to keep that conference package and we don't rent it very often. So, On the magazine, you can't, rent it, you can't do a quarter page anymore? Is that what you're saying? Because it says on magazine, nonprofit rates for display ads, quarter page one month. Oh, correct. Yes, the magazine. We did change, well, we are recommending the change to um, what the Civic Center has. So the Civic Center offers a 25% discount to nonprofits, government agencies, um, things like that, 5013Cs. We are recommending that same rate be offered to the magazine as well. So 25% okay, so versus the set rates that are there. Basically, the answer to my question is, when it says deleted, that doesn't mean the service isn't available. It means that the definition and pricing for that particular Correct. item is still available, but in another category, uh, just described Correct. another yes. way. I'm sorry, I should have answered it that way. Yes. No, that, well, that, that's, that's where I was trying to go with the question. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, and, it, and it'll depend on based on the fee in that situation. Um, I'm going to jump to this later, but I can bring it up now. So the, the all of those things are basically still yeah, We're not going to charge a set rate for nonprofit. It will go to 25%. Um, the conference package will not be there. They can still get all the amenities, but that is a, a, a bundle that will not be offered. Let me find. Um, like the community, uh, community center central, um, the stage it will not be offered a stage in that building anymore. So that is one example of a service actually not being there anymore. So and we don't, we don't and, have a fee for it if it's not going to be offered. And that makes sense from y'all's utilization, et cetera, et cetera, the tracking y'all do. The, the other comment, the comments that Mr. Larson made about church residents paying for things, my opinion is probably identical to his. I don't think anybody should pay any less than a citizen of shirt space because we are the residents. Anybody else should pay the same or more. And I do understand it's a tracking problem to keep track. If I walk up and say I'm going to do this event and I live in the city of shirts, but I'm doing it for somebody in Cibolo, that's probably not an ethical thing to do. And if I do something under my name, I should probably show up for the event. So I understand the, the difficulty you have in doing those things. But like Mr. Larson, I think that every facility, every, every facility in the city of Shirts should be available to every citizen in the city of Shirts at the bottom price. And if HEB wants to have a deal to use the pool, they should not pay that price. They should pay more because they're not paying for the pool like those of us in this audience that are citizens of Shirts. That's just a personal comment. My feeling kind of matches Mr. Larson's. Doesn't mean I'm right but it means that's how I feel. And thanks for the answers to the other questions. I want to make sure our citizens can use our facilities, and that's why I was asking about the word delete. And I understand that basically they can still get everything they need without any big problem. I did notice that a lot of these percentages, 12 and a half, 15, 20, one of them is even 30% increase over one year. I'm glad our regular cost of living doesn't go up quite like that. That would be really expensive for us to pay our bills. Correct, and, and the fees are increasing um, a little bit higher in percentage uh, now because in 10 years we've, we've not increased those rates. We're 
playing a little bit of catch up. And I thank you for bringing up the screen that you have now because that's what we're seeing. That's what we that's what y'all gave us. It wasn't what was on the slide, so to speak. So it's not in the same order. So that, that made it easy to talk about it. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you have a, a few more fees I want to go over? It's, it's uh, other fees. They, they would have no uh, fiscal impact, let's say, on the general fund or the other funds that they're located. I want to cover them real quickly. Um, the library is going to add a maximum charge for an overdue library loan item, so $5, uh, so it doesn't keep it growing and growing and growing in an exorbitant amount. There would be a cap. Uh, they reduce the cost of replacing a library card from $5 to $1. Um, flip side, they increase the charge for a damaged or missing DVD case from $1 to $3. Um, they're adding a material recovery fee for items sent to collection of $10. So if we actually send someone, there's a library service that we can contract out to actually go try to recover some the item or um, some money. We reserve the right to charge an additional $10 for that. Uh, we touched on the magazine. The nonprofit rates will now be set at a 25% discount instead of a standalone set fees with varying percentages. And um, we couldn't find a real old rhyme or reason why those rates were set where they, the way they were. So it's a flat 25% to mimic the um, uh, Civic Center. Uh, the city event fees, that's more of an information item. Uh, we're just going to set those fees in the fee schedule. Um, those are the vendor fees for the events. So we have a set charge that they can look up throughout the year. Um, the police is another information item. They're adding a state mandated fee for a, a body camera recordings uh, request. Uh, the base fee is $10 budget plus additional $1 per minute and that was set by the uh, uh, Texas administration uh, statute and I, that will be provided for you as well next week in the packet. Um, fire services, it looks like uh, quite a bit. Um, the essence of that is before we would list every single supply and item that could be charged on a hazmat cleanup in the fee schedule. Um, it made it hard if prices changed in the middle of it, uh, depending on who was, who was working. Uh, the solution that we're offering now is to um, remove all of those additional line by line fees and just say if we use it, we're going to pass those costs on to uh, onto the a person responsible for the cleanup, usually an insurance agency or someone that caused the spill. So if we have, if our guys are out there for so much time, use, so, um, use these supplies, use these equipment, we'll charge the actual price for that um, and also remove a 15% admin markup that was on the other one. It will no longer be on this one. Um, the EMS class fees are going from 1,000 to 100, 1,100. And they're increasing the per capita charge um, 3% as allowed by the interlocal agreements to uh, 1425. So that's within the uh, contracts with each of the communities. And then Public Works, they're increasing the uh, meter installation fees to um, match the increase in the price of meters that we're seeing. So uh, meter installation fees are made up of two parts. The labor it is, takes to install them and the meter itself. So we're going to uh, increase that to match the meter process. So, so James, are you saying that they're going to do it for a half inch, three quarters inch, full inch? It's going to be different prices, right? Yes, there'll be bigger Each meter sizes. Gotcha. Never Thank different you. Different prices. Yeah. So that's the summary of all of the fees. Uh, I did want to touch on the fee schedule uh, real quick. Uh, the one we have in front of you, this will also be emailed out and included in the packet as well for citizen review. Um, what we have here, the first 15 or so pages are a summary of the changes. We have the, uh, the non-utilities up front and then we have the utilities following that. Um, changes are, of course, in red and they're read through all, throughout all the document. The rest of the document is the actual fee schedule itself and the items that are changing are still marked in red there. This is just a summary of everything that's changing so you can get a glimpse of what the staff is recommending. If it says NA in 2016-17, it means it wasn't a set fee before, and then we're adding it to the fee schedule. And then if it's a black number followed by a red number, it was before and after, so you can see the changes. We have each department then broken down. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that, um, one of the reasons I did a summary slides, because it's, bunch of different fees, but most of them can be summarized in a, in, a, in a few 
sentences. Meters. And just to go over the, the water rate, so we charge a, um, we have an inside the city and outside the city rate. The block rate or the base rate, as it's called, is a set dollar amount uh, set per meter size. So the 5 8 inch is a standard residential meter. So if, if you don't use any water at all, but you have an account set up, you'll be charged that block rate, that first number, that 2319, uh, or as the proposed 2389. And then for every additional 1,000 gallons used, um, you get charged an additional per 1,000 gallon rate. Um, the per 1,000 gallon rates are set throughout all meter sizes, um, but the amount uh, in each bracket, amount of water consumed in each bracket differs once you get further into the more industrial sections. You'll see it go from um, the 0, 6, 9, 12, more of a residential light use uh, to the one and a half, which is 15, 30, 45, 60. These are the guys that are using a lot of water. Um, their base rate's higher, and then while the same per 1,000 gallons, they're going to be using much more of that rate. And the water and sewer fees do have in, inside and outside the city. Uh, one other piece I wanted to cover. That was the uh, staff was proposing the uh, Sarah customers be charged the overall city one rate. There's about 50 people out there right now. Um, it is uh, our rate substantially less, and as we're going forward, we're rolling in uh, those rates into the city overall one rate, so that everyone's paying the same, whether on GBRA, CCMA, or Sarah. Uh, right now, when it started, it started with the CCN um, jurisdiction in question. Uh, staff recommended we set up the rates to basically be a pass-through almost, whatever Sarah charged the city, we turn around and charge directly to the Sarah customers. There was no additional admin rate on top of that, so the city wasn't making any money on, on those rates. Uh, going forward, the overall cost be rolled in with the overall city rate, and that will be uh, make sure that we bring in enough revenue to cover all of the expenses for sewer collection and treatment. That's all I have. If there's any questions from council tonight, I can answer. Certainly answer them to the best of my ability. If not, we can, we'll be back next week um, with additional information and some more backup for the fees and that we can, you'll have time to review and we can ask questions and answer them then. Very good. Council, this is on for discussion. Other questions for uh, Mr. Walters or comments? Mr. Crawford? Mr. Walters, under the heading of convenience only, if you think we're going to discuss items in detail on the first 15 pages, which are not numbered, and the next page is from 1 to 40 plus or whatever it is that are numbered. Could you number the first 15 if you think we're going to make reference to them? Yes, sir. Because on page 5, there are some issues about discounts or rates that Mr. Davis found. And I had to figure out where page 5 was. Not a big deal, but it just makes it faster if we do discuss this in detail next week. Sure. Thank you. <coughs> Council, anyone else? Just, there was some commentary made about um, charging different rates, and uh, I, I would, speaking personally, would, would be cautious about charging different rates. Um, on one hand, you, you have a uh, you have a supply demand thing that goes on, and uh, that will be affected by any disparity in rates. Um, and I would be very careful about. Uh, having a different set of rates for our business community. They said they actually pay the same ad valorem taxes that our residents pay. Uh, they are subject to the same fees for their water and their garbage pickup, and we require them, if they're a retail establishment, to uh, collect our taxes and remit them to the state and have the state remit them back to us. So uh, I would be very careful about putting our business community in, in a state of penalty um, when, when they pay the same taxes and fees as the residents do. Uh, if there is a feasible way, to Mr. Larson's point, philosophically, if there is an easy way, if there is a cost-effective way, and one that is not negative or deleterious to the, to the business aspect of running the facilities, uh, to give advantage to our local residents and businesses, I'd love to see it. I haven't been able to figure that one out yet, and it's probably one of the reasons we went to a flat fee for everybody. But if, if there is a way that staff has and you believe that, that we could pull that off, I'd be all ears, definitely. 
All right. Anything else? All right. Well, this will be coming back for us uh, to consider uh, next week, you said? Yes. Very good. Thank you. All right. Uh, next item I have here is a, a discussion or action regarding City Council rules of conduct and procedures. Um, I asked this to be put on the agenda just very briefly. The City Attorney suggested, um, and it was Mr. Zek, not Dan, uh, that the items that I provided to the City as advice from the Chair, there were three items that I provided, uh, one of which was regarding how we would handle any objection to the placing of items on future agendas. One was regarding what uh, the procedure might be for you to take up if the mayor, the mayor pro tem, and the senior council member were not pres present. Um, and Mr. Larson, you reminded me what the other one was earlier, the, um, the executive session, how the rules of council do actually apply in executive session. Uh, and uh, again, Mr. Zach told me to put that on the agenda and just see if council has any questions about any of those. Um, because it needed to be brought up in open session, not just in a letter format. I didn't think anybody, I think, I think everybody was good, but I just want to be sure. Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on. Next item we have on the agenda this evening are consent agenda items. Item number one, the minutes, approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of July 25th, 2017. Item number two, ordinance 17T24, an ordinance by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing a budget amendment to fund the Shirts Queue event, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict with this ordinance and providing an effective date. And item number three, excuse council absences, consideration or action excusing City Council member uh, Dr. Kaiser from uh, the July 25th meeting. Any of these that need to be considered individually? Not is there a motion to prove uh, prove the items on consent? So move. Second. I have a motion from uh, Mr. Thompson, a second from Mr. Crawford. Any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Item number four, discussion item, scheduling a special meeting of the city council. Approval of scheduling a special city council meeting for August 29, 2017. I assume this is a, a response to a need for addressing the uh, budget items. That's correct, Mayor. That lets us move the budget through the appropriate public hearings uh, to add that meeting. Very good. Chair moves that we add a special city council meeting for August 29, 2017. Second. I caught both ears. So second from Mr. Edwards. Any other comments or questions from council? And then I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes and no nays. The motion carries. Item number five. Mayor? Yes. Uh, who made the motion? Uh, I did from the chair. Uh, item number five, resolution 17R57, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, calling an election to be held on November 7, 2017, for the purpose of electing council members for place three, place four, and place five for a three-year term and making provision for the conduct of the election, authorizing contracts with the elections administrators of Bear and Guadalupe counties to conduct this election, authorizing the election to be held as a joint election, resolving other matters incident and related to such election, and declaring an effective date. Ms. Schmeckel? Council Mayor, um, basically this is pretty simple. It's what we do every year. Um, the uh, general election this year is November 7th, and it's to elect council member places three, four, and five for three-year terms uh, to begin this November 2017 and ending in 2020. Uh, we uh, have been holding our elections this way in conjunction with Guadalupe County and Bear County. Um, there's several benefits and that is um, it kind of cut cost it cut, cut costs for us uh, that way you know it's not so expensive for individually to do it um, the we use common poll locations common equipment voting clerks um, and we it a little bit I'm sure it reduces a little bit of confusion for voters uh, although they still will remain confused on some items uh, the action before you tonight is for uh, you to authorize staff to finalize these agreements with Bear and Guadalupe counties and their election administrators to conduct the city election, as well as finalize the joint uh, contracts with the entities. Um, we have some estimated costs, and they're at the high level. If there's other entities that join in, then those costs will likely drop. But for like Guadalupe and Comal, which is going to be uh, administered by Guadalupe County, that's uh, 27000 and some change. Uh, Bear County, it would be $4,000. Again, this is on the high note. 
Uh, if other entities other entities join in, in that that price could drop. <clears throat> the um, you have before you the the draft Guadalupe County early voting and election day precincts, uh, and then also for Bear County, and the finals will not be available until mid August. But so they'll be coming around pretty quick. They'll be finalizing that. And Brenda did want me to mention that. <clears throat> Um, early voting by personal appearance will begin on October 23rd and it will end on November 3rd this year. Uh, the early voting locations will be posted to our website as usual and you know they'll, it's the same process they'll be able to just click on the banner and it'll all be there. Uh, and then also we do get questions each year the last day to submit a voter registration application in time to be able to vote for the election this year would be um, October 9th. And the election day locations are, as usual, will be published uh, on our websites. And if anybody has any other questions, they can, of course, call the city secretary's office and we'll try to help them. Very good, thank you. This is largely ministerial in the way that we conduct our elections each year. Uh, council, any questions for Mr. Meckel? Mr. Mayor, I make a motion we approve resolution number 17R57. Second. I have a motion for Mr. Edwards, a second for Mr. Crawford, I believe. Any other comments or questions from council? None I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes and no nays. The motion carries. All right. Uh, the next item that we have on the agenda this evening is a roll call vote confirmation. We'll give Ms. Donna just a second to get back over there. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and read these in the order in which they were, were on the agenda. Um, items one, two, three are consent items. Motion was made by Council Member Thompson, seconded by Council Member Crawford. Mayor Pro Tem Edwards voted yes. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item number four. Scheduling a special city council meeting for August 29th, 2017. Motion was made by Mayor Carpenter, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Edwards. Mayor Pro Tem Edwards voted yes. Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item number five, resolution number 17, R57. Motion was made by Mayor Pro Tem Edwards, seconded by Council Member Crawford. Mayor Pro Tem Edwards voted yes. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Item number six, resolution number 17R54. Motion made by Mayor Pro Tem Edwards, seconded by Council Member Gutierrez. Mayor Pro Tem Edwards voted yes. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Thank you, ma'am. Next item that we have on our agenda this evening is a closed session. The City Council will meet in closed session under Section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code Personnel Matters to deliberate the appointment of a municipal judge. So our open session will be uh, in recess until such time as we're able to return. We'll return as quickly as we can.
Okay, my apologies. Um, it's about uh, oh, 8.45, knowing that that clock above me is a bit slow, and we're now back in open session. Item that we have uh, next on the agenda is item 7A, take any action based on discussions held in closed session under agenda item 7. And I'm going to make a motion from the chair that we appoint Mr. Daryl Dunlig as our uh, municipal court, court judge, effective immediately, as he'd be compensated uh, at the same rate as Judge Hernser, and that we retain the services of Judge Tekas uh, as our um, uh, secondary and backup municipal court judge. Second. Have a motion and a second. Motions from me, from the chair, Donna, and from Mr. Edwards, a second. Uh, any other comments or questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 The seven ayes and no nays, the motion carries. All right, next item on the agenda is a roll call vote confirmation on the action we just took. Item 7A, um, a motion was made by Mayor Carpenter, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Edwards, to appoint Daryl Dunnig. Dolnig. How, how do you spell that? D U L L N I G. Dolnig. Dolnig. As the municipal court judge at the same rate that Judge Hersner had? Mm -hmm. is, there, is there more? And that we retain the services of Judge Tekas as our backup and secondary municipal court judge. Retain Judge Tekas, T A K A S. As the backup judge? Mm hmm. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Edwards voted yes. Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Thompson, Kaiser, and Crawford voted yes. Motion passed. Thank you, ma'am. Next item on the agenda, requests and announcements. And the first is uh, announcements by the city manager, Mr. Kessel. Mr. Kessel. Mayor, council, just a quick update from the retreat. Uh, we had uh, the opportunity to work with Comal County and audit the rest of the numbers. Uh, we were able to identify at least one additional property, if not more, that uh, was incorrectly coded, uh, and those have been corrected at this point, uh, and we have recalculated the, the effective rate. We don't think it's going to change, uh, except as you might find normal and customary with uh, protests uh, that will come in during the month of August, uh, which is a fairly small percentage. Um, it's actually b uh, very good news in our favor and is much more what we expected uh, once those errors were corrected. Uh, the current rate, as a reminder, is 49.11. Uh, we're now calculating the effective rate at 49.10. So it's is that one one hundredth uh, below uh, our our current rate, uh, whereas before on Friday it had been 49.49 uh, before the corrections. Uh, so that's very good news. Uh, the rollback rate, uh, if you're tracking that, if that's important, is. 5083. And so uh, we'll be balancing uh, the budget against those uh, numbers. And uh, as kind of a, a frame of reference from Friday's conversation, the items that were in the green, uh, those would be funded uh, with the effective rate, which is now 1 100th. Is that correct? Two of the three would be funded with the with the effective rate, I think it's off by three thousand four hundred and forty-one dollars or something. Uh, so we'll we'll work on that. So I just wanted to give that update, uh, so you wouldn't be surprised next Tuesday uh, with a different number than what you saw in a different cut line and and so on. So very good news uh, based on the audit of Comal County. Very good. Thank right. thank, thank goodness for right. the. Um, wisdom of our state legislature and the way that we conduct our uh, uh, annual budget season. Mr. Crawford. That means we'll see this next Tuesday, what you just said again, right? Y yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Definitely. All right, item number nine, placing items on a future agenda. Does anybody have anything we need to have on a future? Yes, Mr. Crawford. I have two things and one question. Hmm? We're going to talk about the fee schedule on the next agenda, is that correct? That is correct. So I can ask my question then and not have to put anything on the agenda for that. Absolutely. It will already be on the agenda. Absolutely. It's just a minor little thing. The first thing I'd like to propose we put on the agenda is the discussion in executive session 
for hiring a new prosecutor now that we've appointed a prosecutor to be our judge. Indeed. So uh, if we could, for next week's uh, agenda, have an item for the appointment of a, uh, of a prosecutor. Um, <clears throat> and if you would, invite our new municipal court judge to join us for that discussion. Ms. Crawford, you said another? And the second item is a discussion. I'm not sure how to word this, but you can help clear that up. Uh, the comments that were made on the on Facebook about talking to city council members to tell them to do something when you're a, an appointed volunteer for a committee under the heading of ethics and proper conduct. I'm not sure. We can't limit somebody's right to say things on Facebook, but when you're on a committee, if you're the president of a, of a group of a committee or the, or the, the chairman, we should be held to higher standards. I'd like to have a discussion about that under the EDC heading in particular. And all committees in general, because we don't, we don't have anything that says what committees are responsible and how they should behave to a higher standard because they're on a committee. I concur. I, mean, I think doesn't that mean we'll have anything, but, it, yeah. but we need to have a, a discussion. It can be open. It can be executive, whatever the council decides if they want to do this. But we, but we need to get it started out because we, you can't tell me not to put something on Facebook, I don't think. I have the right to do that. I concur. So I think that needs to be uh, discussed by the council, if, uh, whether or not the council wish to, wishes to enact any policies or restrictions Separate. or whatever on um, Social media. Uh, the uh, um, social media conduct for council and or members of boards, committees, and commissions. Hopefully that will come through and uh, uh, we will have that in open session. That needs to be vetted in public. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Indeed. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor, we Mr. need to come up with a process so that we, um, for the future, so we can kind of gauge what we've gone through with this municipal judge. We need to have a process in place. We kind of notice something that we don't have a process to replace the municipal judge in the event of a death and or a prosecutor as well. We do have an alternate, but we need to at least explore that. Yeah, I think that should be on a future city council agenda. I'm not sure that it should be the next Tuesday, but but shortly thereafter, the council probably needs to talk about whether or not we want to give some 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 broad parameters about how we will uh, proceed in the future with um, uh, filling a vacancy. Um, in uh, probably any of the uh, positions that report directly to the council, frankly, an unexpected vacancy. Um, it, it was something certainly novel that we've had to uh, deal with with the passing of Judge Hernser. All right, anyone else? If not, we'll move to item 10, announcements by the mayor and council members. And uh, we'll start with Mayor Pro Tem Edwards. None, sir. Uh, Mr. Crawford? Nothing other than I attended the budget session on Friday. Looking forward to the 10th of April of, of August for our next one. Indeed. Mr. Davis? Nothing, sir. Mr. Gutierrez? I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Kessel and the city staff and especially Mr. Walters there for excellent presentation uh, concerning the budget. Thank you. Very, very informative. Mr. Larson? Nothing. Mr. Thompson? Nothing. Dr. Kaiser? Nothing. And uh, I'd just like to compliment the staff uh, for the work that they did on Friday's presentation with regards to the budget. Uh, there were questions about what the, the numbers really were each evening, and, and staff had to keep up with those and the, the inconsistencies from multiple jurisdictions. Uh, that's tough to do, and, and to be able to come through and provide the kind of information uh, in, in a succinct and clear manner as you were able to do uh, is a testament to your capabilities. If there's nothing else from staff or from council, then we stand adjourned.